morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Dave Thompson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made on replacing the two hospitals on Sky. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, NHS Highland are considering service change proposals affecting Sky Locals in South West Ross. The Board carried out a three-month consultation exercise which concluded on the 29th of August 2014. Following the conclusion of this consultation period, NHS Highland are considering the feedback. The Board will then consider all the evidence and make a recommendation on how to proceed. NHS Highland expects that the proposals will be considered by its Board at its meeting on the 2nd of December 2014. Dave Thompson. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I am sure he will also be aware that NHS Highland is to suspend the endoscopy services it currently operates on Sky. Um, given that good progress is being made on planning the new facilities, which will offer enhanced services for Skylock House and South West Ross, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that in the interim, all should be done to ensure existing local surgical facilities continue, if at all possible, and can he tell us when the new hospital is likely to actually be built? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, I have received a copy of the Member's letter to the Chair of NHS Highland on the topic he refers to and will reply in due course and detail. NHS Highland have stated that they have reluctantly decided to suspend endoscopy service provision at the McKinnon Memorial Hospital because the decontamination facilities there are no longer compatible with current standards and are not sufficiently reliable. I will be asking NHS Highland as a matter of urgency to provide me with a full report on why this decision has been made and what other options they have considered, and I will be happy to share this with the member. Question number two, Siobhan McMahon. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Lanarkshire and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, Ministers and Government officials regularly meet with representatives of NHS Lanarkshire to discuss matters of importance to local people. Siobhan McMahon. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline why NHS Lanarkshire spent nearly £6 million between October 2012 and March 2014 referring 3,826 patients? to the Golden Jubilee Hospital and 4,368 patients to Ross Hall Hospital and Nuffield Hospital, private health providers in Glasgow, in order for the treatment time guarantees to be met, does this not expose further creeping privatisation within the NHS Scotland and highlight that the NHS in Scotland is not safe in the SNP's hands? Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, the member has a bit of a cheek given that the main budgetary challenge for NHS Lanarkshire is the £50 million a year they have to pay in PFI charges, which we inherited from the previous administration. Now, as far as privatisation is concerned, I have made it absolutely clear that the percentage of money spent on the private sector in Scotland is well under a 1% of the entire near £12 billion budget and unlike south of the border, where they are privatising NHS staffing and estate and facilities, we are not doing that in Scotland. Where we purchase private sector uh, capacity is because we don't have sufficient capacity in the National Health Service in a particular area, like, for example, the use of Ross Hall for certain procedures by NHS Lanarkshire. That is not privatisation. That is topping up our own capacity. Question number three, Jamie Hepburn. To ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it had with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs regarding employment in Scotland. That's not the question I have on my sheet, Mr Hepburn. It's a question I have in mind, presiding officer. <laughs> and it's the one I lodged. Can I uh, offer our apologies? Uh, it's my sheet that's wrong. Um, Minister, would you like to answer the question as asked by the member? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, no formal discussions have taken place with HMRC. This, of course, is a reserved matter. However, I have written to the UK Government expressing our concerns and highlighting our policy of no compulsory redundancies within the Scottish public sector and asking what alternative employment options the UK Government has in place to protect jobs in Scotland. We will continue to support and assist redeployment of staff through existing mechanisms, and our directorate officials will liaise with HMRC and monitor the situation. 
Jimmy Hepburn. Thank you, President Officer. I'm over my brief uh, confusion. Uh, the uh, HMRC has uh, said, yes, that it's uh, going to outsource uh, mail uh, room facilities. This uh, threatens some 40 jobs at their location uh, in Cumberland. And of course, this is the tip of the iceberg. PCS suggesting uh, that the HMRC is going to shed thousands of jobs in coming years. Does the Minister agree with me that this uh, undermines local economies where HMRC is located? Uh, such as in Cumbernauld, and also undermines HMRC's own ability uh, to collect tax. Yes, sir. Well, I'm inclined to agree with Mr Hepburn, who has pursued this matter assiduously on behalf of his constituents. We understand from HMRC that they say they will need fewer people in certain roles across the whole of the UK, including post-handling. In June, HMRC announced it will close two of its five regional post rooms by the end of 2014. Uh, we believe their current thinking is that the remaining three, including Cumbernauld, will close by March 2015, and HMRC has said it will be able to tell its staff more by mid-October. Uh, one has to say this is not really a very good way to handle staff relations, presiding officer, and in particular, we in the Scottish Government, who try to treat our public servants with appropriate respect, would strongly advocate that the UK government starts to look at the way it handles these matters a bit more carefully, and in particular to adopt the no compulsory redundancy policy of the Scottish government. So I'm grateful for Mr Hepburn to allow us an opportunity to make that, uh, that our position clear, and I would express my concern for his constituents who face a very uncertain future. Question number four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government how investment in hybrid ferries will contribute to its low carbon targets. Minister Keith Brown. Uh, the Scottish Government has invested over £20 million to construct two hybrid ferries, the MV Hallig and the MV Lochinvar. Uh, Mr Stevenson, of course, was involved in this project from its early days and cut the first deal for the MV Hallig in January 2012. The Deputy First Minister announced on the 29th of September that a third hybrid ferry would be ordered from Ferguson Marine Engineering Limited. And these low emission hybrid ferries, built in Scotland, are helping to contribute to the Scottish Government's targets on cutting climate change emissions, with initial operational experience indicating around a 28% fuel saving and an associated reduction in carbon emissions. Stuart Stevenson. Um, it will be very welcome that there is a third uh, hybrid ferry, and I was very pleased to be associated with uh, the previous initiatives. But can the Minister tell us what investment is being made into other forms of public transport in Scotland to ensure that targets on carbon emissions are met? Minister. The Scottish Government invests over £1 billion per year in public and sustainable transport to encourage people uh, onto public transport and active travel modes. And as I announced yesterday in the new ScotRail franchise to uh, Abilio, uh, they have committed to a range of carbon saving initiatives which include at least 3,500 additional cycle parking spaces, £100,000 per annum sustainability innovation fund and electric car charging points in at least 50 uh, station car parks. In addition, of course, uh, Stuart Stevenson will be aware that we have, uh, since 2010, given over £10 million to support the purchase of 126 green buses. Duncan McNeill. I also welcome the, the news that the third hybrid ferry will be, uh, has been awarded to, to Ferguson, so we hope that goes through. Um, uh, everything will be OK there. Um, how can the Scottish Government, though, uh, I, I think, help market this innovative vessel wider than the UK market? Because clearly there is a, a market for those type of ships beyond Scotland. Minister? I think Duncan McNeill raises an important point. How can we make sure we potentially exploit as far as possible what is a very innovative technology? I think the best way we can do that, first of all, is by placing the orders which we have done, but also by operating the vessels ourselves, making the reductions in terms of uh, fuel consumption and also the environmental benefits that we've got. But there is obviously a piece of work to be done in addition to what's already been done to make sure that the wider world and the market out there is aware of the potential of these vessels and, of course, the opportunities that would open up for Ferguson's and others to produce more of these vessels in future. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The, the Minister will be aware that Caledonian Maritime Assets Limited and Caledonian McBrain will place a notice 
in the official journal of the European Communities this month, indicating their plans to order a new Ardrossan to Brodick ferry. Can I confirm that the specification will be for a hybrid ferry, that the contract will be placed in the spring of next year, and that it will be well within the capability and capacity of Ferguson and shipbuilders of Port Glasgow to build it? Minister. Uh, I'm afraid I can't confirm the specification will be for a hybrid ferry because we are considering uh, the potential for liquefied natural gas as well. But I can confirm the contract will be placed in the spring of next year and that it will be well within the capability or, and the capacity uh, of Ferguson shipbuilders of Port Glasgow to build it. Question number five, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government how it is monitoring proposals for the local government budget savings to ensure that they have no adverse consequences for public safety. Minister Derek Mackay. Councils are accountable to the local citizens for the work they do. They are, of course, expected to comply with all legislative and re regulatory burdens. Single outcome agreements (SOAs) set out agreed priorities for local areas. These are progressed by community planning partnerships and provide the framework for community safety partnerships to coordinate a joint agency response to community safety issues. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank uh, the Minister for that response. In that case, does the Minister consider that when residents pay their council tax, they are fully entitled to adequate and safe street lighting, and that the recent proposal from South Lanarkshire Council to de-energise the street lighting in the evening in Castle Avenue, Bothwell, a busy area for joggers, dog, dog, water, dog walkers and cyclists, cannot be justified on these grounds and could be potentially dangerous? Minister. I am not fully aware of the full facts of that local authority's current exercise. I am happy to explore it. But of course they would expect that public health and safety is foremost in local authorities' minds when they are making budget decisions, whilst also delivering programmes of energy efficiency and decarbonisation of the energy sector as well. But of course uh, public interest and safety should be clear in their minds when they are taking such decisions. Sarah Boyer. According to the Scottish Government's own statistics published this weekend, 70,000 posts have disappeared from local authorities since 2008. Can the Minister tell the Chamber how many of those jobs were related to community safety uh, initiatives? Minister. Well, I don't have that information uh, to hand, but what I know is, is that local government settlements have been fair, and uh, local government would certainly agree with that. And I think the fair approach we've taken with local government has ensured that they've been able to deliver efficiencies in a way that hasn't led to the kind of mass redundancies that we've seen south of the border. And those fair settlements will ensure that local government is equipped to continue uh, delivering the kind of quality services that we would all expect. Question six, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the Scottish Government whether it is aware of the lack of funding affecting the Men's 10K event in Glasgow run by the Men's Health Forum for Scotland and what it can do to secure the future of the event? Minister, Cabinet Secretary, Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of promoting men's health and that is why we provided over £500,000 to Men's Health Forum Scotland between 2007 and 2012. I understand that there have been issues in securing funding for the 2015 <coughs> Glasgow Men's 10K event. This type of event can be fun and a visible way to promote causes such as better men's health. It is essential, however, that such events are sustainable as well as successful. The Scottish Government provide funding to Jog Scotland, who have provided expert advice and support to Men's Health Forum Scotland in marketing the 2014 event and organising the associated 5K run. Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I should declare an interest as having participated in the, the 10K event for the last few years, along with thousands of other men, the vast majority of whom say that participation in the event has encouraged them to be fit, healthy and active all year round, not just uh, at the event itself. Following the incredible sporting year that we've had in terms of elite sport in Scotland, surely it would be a disaster if... Uh, in what would have been the 10th anniversary year of this event, it ceases to exist. Can I urge the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary to explore any options with contact organisations or other potential partners who could secure a future for this event? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, first of all, good, good for Patrick Harvey for taking part. Um, well done, setting a good example. Uh, in terms of going forward with the event next year, um, 
Jog Scotland have been in discussions uh, with the organisation. I'm happy to ask uh, my officials to work with Jog Scotland to explore uh, with the organisation what options um, could allow the 2015 uh, and future events to happen. Uh, but they have to be sustainable, and I think the organisation does have to look at its business case, and I think that's where there have been some ongoing discussions with Jog Scotland. But I'm happy to ask my officials to meet with Jog Scotland, with the organisation again, and see whether there is anything more that can be done uh, to get the event happening next year. Question number seven, Gil Patterson. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government how many people have been supported by the protection of funding for the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. Minister Derek Mackay. According to official statistics published on the 30th of September 2014, 537,730 people in Scotland are currently supported in meeting their council tax liabilities through the Council Tax Reduction Scheme. Bill Patterson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and uh, say that I welcome measures such as the Council Tax Reduction Scheme that the Scottish Government is putting in place to help those in Scotland who are paying a heavy price for the UK's uh, government's welfare reforms. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that George Osborne's freeze in regards to the in-work benefits and the impact that this will have on the working poor in Scotland? And does he agree that control over welfare is something the S Smith Commission needs to deliver? The question is a bit broader than the supplement is a bit broader than the uh, question, Minister. Uh, well, I can say in response that uh, the attacks on uh, working people this time from the uh, Tory UK government is of concern, but we would agree essentially with the point that in order to tackle poverty and protect citizens from future cuts, of course we require the powers to be able to do so, and that's a case we will of course make to the Smith Commission. Question number eight, Stuart McMillan. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on powers relating to gambling being devolved. Minister Derek Mackay. Uh, during the referendum campaign, the Government identified the advantages of this Parliament making decisions on gambling. Many of these advantages would also be realised by devolution of gambling in the Planned Scotland Bill. Uh, the Government will be playing a full part in the Smith Commission in arguing for extensive devolution of further substantial powers to Scotland in line with the vow made by the UK parties during the referendum. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that response. And the Minister will be aware of certainly the active campaign I have been running in relation to fixed odds betting terminals, and this includes holding a members' debate here in the Parliament uh, earlier on this year. But does the Minister therefore agree with me that the gambling powers that should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament in order to allow for gambling legislation to be created in line with town centre planning policy? and for action to be taken in Scotland in a way that currently isn't across the UK. Minister. Uh, yes, I do. I would commend Stuart McMillan's uh, work on this particular issue. And to be able to realise the aspirations from many members across the parties in this chamber and our partners uh, in local government and other stakeholders, we do require the powers around gambling. And that's also a case uh, we'll make to the Smith Commission so that we can realise the aspirations to tackle some of the problem uh, gambling that is experienced in Scotland. Question 9, Maureen Watt. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the effectiveness of the arrangements relating to the Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 and their operation. Minister Margaret Burgess. The Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 sets minimum standards for the property management industry and provides protections for homeowners who use the services of, pro of a property factor. The Act requires the Scottish Ministers to maintain a register of property factors and requires each factor to be registered with ministers and to abide by a statutory code of conduct. The Scottish Government has put in place arrangements that enable ministers and property factors to comply with their duties under the Act. Briefly, Ms. Watt. I thank the Minister for that answer. Does the Minister believe that there can, is any flexibility in the system regarding land owning property factors whereby the owners are the ones on the new housing estate who would be able to decide on the green space ownership and its maintenance? Briefly, Minister. Um, we are, there are provisions in the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003 on the dismissal and replacement of factors. We are aware there are potential difficulties in relation to uh, landowning maintenance companies. And following the Justice Committee's report last year into the effectiveness of the 2003 Act, the Scottish Government is preparing a voluntary code of practice on the dismissal and replacement of landowning 
owning land maintenance companies and we intend to consult uh, key bodies in a draft of this code shortly and we'll keep the member up to date on this. Thank you. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr Pasquale Terracciano, the Ambassador of Italy to the United Kingdom.